Uh, since we have a whole bunch of people here who are not architects, shame on you. Uh, I'm Aaron Betsky. I have the honor of being the president of the School of Architecture at Taliesin. And let me say that graphic designers seem to be much better dressed than architects. Uh, but welcome all tonight to uh, the Michael Beirut Lecture. Now, that's Michael Beirut pronounced B-E-I, but written B-I-E, just in case you're taking notes. Uh, we're very, very happy and proud to have him here. I'm also happy to say that he actually has outdrawn Frank Gehry in terms of his public. So we are very lucky to be here tonight. Uh, we have some VIPs here that I want to pull out, uh, including one of our board members, Max Underwood, right here in the front row. Uh, and then we have some of our faculty and staff here. We have Matthew Chabotowski. We have Lloyd Nadoff somewhere. They're uh, here. We have Effie Casey. Uh, and we have especially our great uh, Lena and Elaine up there somewhere who have helped us get to our accreditation preparation. So we're especially grateful to them. And our ninja CFO, Lisa. Uh, and our two Jasons, the smaller and the taller, uh, <laughs> are both here tonight. So if I'm forgetting anyone, uh, we're very. Oh, and we have my cousin Jackie here. Also very, uh, so we're very, very happy that you're all here. We're also extremely grateful to the Rio Salado Architecture Foundation for helping to make uh, tonight's event possible, as well as the uh, Arizona Community Foundation help also underwrite this. And if you want to be part of our happy family, uh, there are flyers here that are on this table here that tell you all about what we're trying to do here at the School of Architecture. And oh, we also have another staff member, Rob. And if you finally come to your senses and realize that graphic design is a dying profession <laughs> and want to switch into architecture, Rob up there can help you with all the necessary business points. And we'd be glad to have you here at the School of Architecture for Cali Essen. Um, I also want to say, for those of you who are actually architects, there are a few here, you will or can receive a continuing education credit for tonight's event. We actually have the list there to prove that you have been here uh, and you will receive the appropriate credit. Um, I also want to point out that we have a few other lectures coming up. Uh, next Monday, we still have one or two seats for Patrick Schumacher, the head of Zaha Hadid Architects, who is here because he's a brilliant guy, uh, even though I disagree with everything he says, but he's a brilliant guy and a great architect and uh, he also is fulfilling a pledge made by Zaha Hadid, who was supposed to be here uh, about two weeks after she passed away. So we're very happy to have Patrick here. Uh, and then on the 22nd, we have Fernando Romero, who actually will be speaking at the David and Glass Wright House off of Camelback. So join us for that. We also have Jack DeBartolo, who is sitting with us tonight as well, who will be speaking uh, on Actually, Jeff, we need to talk. And we, have you on the 15th. <laughs> we might ask whether you can do it on the 15th. So we'll be talking to you about But we have more <laughs> lectures, and they're all listed on this uh, as well. But tonight, all the way from the Big Apple, and despite a serious case of laryngitis, uh, we have with us Michael Beirut, and are very, very happy with that. 
Uh, I'll give you the basics. I just gave him a compliment. I, we were talking and I said something like, uh, well, you're, after all, you're a few years younger than I am. Uh, it turns out he's actually older than I am, which is really embarrassing. Uh, but he is uh, an amazing and very famous graphic designer, I'm sure you all know. He went to the University of Cincinnati, where I taught for many years, uh, and somehow survived that. Moved to New York, where he worked for Vignelli Associates and rose to be their vice president. And I'm sure he will talk about what a great influence they were on uh, him. Uh, but since 1990, he has been at Pentagram, the, uh, depending on how you see it, either the evil empire or the saving grace of American architecture, the firm that sort of defines what good design is in American architecture. And well with them, he has worked for all the best clients uh, from Hillary Clinton. He is the one who came up with that arrow that was supposed to lead us in the right direction despite some problems uh, <laughs> that happened in the meantime that led to a criminal in the White House. But <laughs> I hope at some point we'll rectify that. Uh, he has worked from everything from United Airlines to the Melbourne Library, which he's doing right now. And what's even more important, he worked for the Cincinnati Art Museum when I was there uh, many moons ago. And now the uh, School of Architecture at Taliesin, uh, Jose, stand up, turn around, oh. with his lovely logo that's now <laughs> right Michael Bay Design. Jose is not a Michael Bay Design. Uh, <laughs> uh, he did our graphic design here, and uh, we are extremely grateful because he did such a great job. In addition to that, he has been president of the American Institute of Graphic, uh, Arch uh, graphic Designers, AIGA, artists, graphic artists, sorry. Uh, and the uh, AG, which is even more prestigious, the Alliance Graphique Internationale. He has won the gold med medal for AIGA. He has been collected by every major art museum in America, including uh, one when I was there, the San Francisco Museum of Art. Um, and is, I think, widely re uh, regarded as the most uh, eminent and preeminent. Uh, graphic designer in America. Um, he has written two books, no, he's written many books, but two books of a special interest, one which was just simply called 79 Short Essays on uh, Graphic Design, on Design, uh, which was just mind-blowingly brilliant, uh, and uh, it's based on mainly the blogs he did for Design Observer, which he helped to found, and for which he's still a contributing editor. And then he recently put out the book, which has to have the longest and most interesting title of all design books in the world, which is, and I uh, read the title here completely, how to, and I have to read it actually, how to use graphic design to sell things, explain things, make things look better, make people laugh, make people cry, and every so now and then, once in a while, change the world, which is of course what we say here at the School of Architecture Taliesin, that we want to change the world. All of that leads me to say that Michael Beirut is the heart and soul of graphic design. By heart, I mean that he stands for the great traditions of graphic design and how they can discipline our visual field, everything that we see around us, into a form of great legibility and beauty, but also for the soul of graphic design, which is that graphic design can inspire us and can, in fact, change the world. But even beyond that ability, the reason why I am so happy that he is here is because, as some of you heard me say last week, I really want to be Michael Bay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to write like Michael Bay writes. I want to design like he does. I want to be as funny as he is. I just want to be Michael Bay. I can't be, but here he is. <laughs> I really do have laryngitis. <laughs> I can kill a little time. 
by adjusting the aspect ratio of the display. Graphic designers, you right? Okay. This is boring, but it might be interesting to watch. What's this thing? Scale. The only other choice we have. Even worse, right? Can you, uh, can you get the aspect ratio right on this? It's all stretched. Is it, well, it's, I don't think it's that as this, I think. I've never done it on a keynote before. Ooh, well, it's not keynote now. No, now you're just oh. on the operating system. So how's everyone doing? Yeah, anyone want any, uh, any Ricola throat lock? You can't have any. So, why are you doing that? I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron Betsky, everyone. Would you please, I realize I just did it. Uh, would you please not only turn off your phone, but please put it on airplane mode because we are streaming Sorry. on Facebook Live and we don't have enough bandwidth. <laughs> so, I'm sure your loved ones will forgive you. Get back to all your important texts and keep your conversations later. <laughs> Just turn it off right now. That's up there. If you hold on the option key when you when you hit scale, it exactly. brings up a bunch of other things. So let's see, how does that look, guys? Is it better? Better. I think that's it. You did it. Good. That's Michael too. You architects had no idea what was going on there. That, that's supposed to look a certain way, and now it does. John is screaming. Thrilled to be around. Aaron Betsky, this is my latest book. Now you see it. Turn it over. In case you were curious, I am the most perceptive and wittiest writer of working design. Tonight. Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate that. Aaron gets a free book. <laughs> so um, uh, we already had a quick display of this. Everyone here probably knows at least one thing I did, which was uh, this. They might not know where it came from, though, which is the logo morphs to assume all these different shapes. And it's motivated partly by rights architecture and any other impulses you can put into it. So there are a lot of architects here, so I want to talk about the connection between graphic design, which is what I do, and how that connects with architecture and what this place is famous for. So let's call it graphic architecture, okay? So this is actually peace in our time. Graphic designers in the audience, architects in the audience, we can all have a rapprochement and kind of all get together and walk out holding hands, right? Kid from Ohio, that's me. Easter Sunday, 1969. Oh, wait, I have, a, I have a pointer. That's me. <laughs> Twin brothers, Ronald and Donald. <laughs> but my first big job in New York. <clears throat> So that was my, well, my adopted parents, uh, these great Italian designers. Way back when, here. And Mr. Vignelli uh, passed away a few years ago. Layla Vignelli passed away just a little bit more than a year ago. And, but they had a huge influence in my life, partly because, because they were trained both as architects 
and worked as designers, and, and graphic designers, interior designers, product designers. They sort of instilled a passion in me for architecture that I've had my whole career. So I'm fascinated by how design happens, how people work together, how design is experienced by people, and sort of how it works. So that's, that's why I called that book How To. Not because it's like a guide explaining how you can do it, although I guess it is. But, be, but also because I think it's a way, the mechanics of how it happens is just so fascinating. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when I clear my throat, this horrible sound comes out that isn't good either. <laughs> I, know, I won't even try to do that anymore. So that'll be the theme of my talk tonight, how to do things, okay? How to, nice and big. Yeah, honest to God, this is like, I, I, I spent all afternoon writing this thing so that if it all shut down, I could just go like this. Okay, Robert, Robert Ames Stern got appointed head of the Yale School of Architecture. Aaron's, uh, Aaron Besky's on my um, and he's legendary for his mastery of historic styles. He really is a, um, um, you know, a, a, a scholar of architectural history and can deploy it when the context requires it. Very different from Zaha Hadid or Frank Gehry or some of the architects you mentioned who have their own signature style. Bob, I think, is able to be a little bit of a chameleon. I think when he arrived at Yale, there's Mr. Stern, Oh, so, so I designed a whole series of books for him that celebrate that ability. A lot of the books look like that. Trajan, typography, centered, formal, right? When he became dean at Yale, there was like some fear that somehow he would try to make everyone design the way he did. But he, he did not want to do that. He said to me, when he commissioned me to do all their graphic design, he said, I want to surprise people. So he wanted to be open to all kind of views. So not like this. Trajan, formal, but more like this, okay? So he was there for 15 or so years. Over that period, we designed nearly 100 posters for them, and we never used the same display typeface twice, to my knowledge, at least. I think accidentally we might have done it. We had to use a lot of really weird typefaces, but um, uh, what we were trying to achieve was sort of the sense of identity through diversity. So <clears throat> this is from the late 90s, early on. We would do thematic things for symposia, like something like Architecture in the Public Realm, where it's bringing in the theme of art and architecture in Yale. A lot of lecture posters that go back so far that they have objects that some people in this room do not know what they are. What are those oddly shaped squares? They used to be really important. Um, <laughs> And anyone of a certain age like me, somewhere in some closet somewhere, has some boxes with some carousel try things. And, then, and that's why we all love that show, Mad Men, right? Because Don Draper uses those two. Um, the lecture posters would just take any form we wanted to have taken. We had a very kind of forgiving and patient uh, client. Uh, sometimes the typography was just punctuation. Sometimes it's just one big piece of punctuation. Crazy ornamental frames. And so then we get bored with that and we would do something where we just stack them up like that. Um, when we would, every one of these uh, posters has a Y and a circle for the logo. So this is about a symposium on architecture and psychoanalysis. And so the Y is a Rorschach plot. Can you see that? Um, um, architecture and urbanism. This is a, um, a symposium on Charles Moore. Um, the architects who know Sea Ranch will kind of get this homage to Deborah Stalfiger Solomon's uh, super graphic she did there. Sometimes they would give me a title for a symposium. I didn't know what it meant. And advice for graphic designers, when that happens, just make it really big like you do know what it means. <laughs> they have a bunch of open, uh, open houses where um, uh, it's really just about come to Yale, learn about architecture. So it turns out that Y has a little arrow in it too. Some big typography, a uh, symposium on the theme of seduction. Uh, we commissioned Marion Banjis to do this sexy, sexy, sexy lettering here. O, o Pan House, you get that right? Um, we just. <laughs> there's, there's a, that show Concentration with Hugh Downs isn't on TV anymore, I don't think, but that was my favorite show when I was a kid. Um, so this poster it just uses only the smallest size we ever used on the poster, and I said, 
um, will underline the important things, and if they're really important, we'll underline them and make them bold, and they let us do it once, never again. <laughs> Berlin, once it was divided, open house again, keys. Um, uh, a symposium on George Nelson, who uh, did a, uh, his office did a uh, very well-known clock like this, and somehow I'm always lucky. I knew that George Nelson had uh, 12 letters in his name, even without counting. I just have a sixth sense about those things. So a lot of it just was exploring what typography could do. Digital postmodernities. I've had really good designers in my office, like uh, Carrie Powell and Eve Ludwig and uh, Lacey Ho and Jessica Svensson, who did this one and that one. This was about um, globalism and uh, uh, its impact on, on architecture and building. It's a uh, Buckminster Fuller um, Dimaxian map. And I think this was the last one we did, the last open house we did for Bob Stern was this one. If you know the uh, famous um, uh, building in which, the, uh, uh, in which the School of Architecture has been for years, you recognize that uh, concrete pattern. So then all these were the same size, they're all black and white. So then Bob retires from that position, and he's replaced by the first woman to lead the school in history, Deborah Burke. And so we decided to change just one thing and introduce color. There's Deborah. And so she, she was kind enough to let us start with a big pink poster and didn't think that was that. So this was the first poster we did for her pink. And so we've sort of changed up the, the way we're doing it graphically. Once you start changing the colors, it turns out if you change the typography too, it just looks too crazy. So we're kind of stabilizing the type a little bit. Symposium. Another symposium, Environment Reconsidered. It's an open house poster. It's always using just two typefaces. This one now the same two typefaces over and over again. So I was afraid that like I would be gone. My voice is going, so I'll need these slides. But every new project starts with a black slide that says how to. OK, that's how you'll know we're starting one project. Okay. So sometimes I'm supposed to channel the past. Uh, and um, I was asked to do new signs for a New York skyscraper on Park Avenue called Lever House, designed by uh, SOM's Gordon Bunshaft in 1952, I think. I didn't look it up. Um, and so we, we couldn't find a typeface that we thought was right. So we, there's, that's, uh, it was the first class in steel skyscraper on Park Avenue. Um, and and now there are many of them, and none of them really as good as this one. Even Seagram Building is not as good as this one, if you ask me. Architects don't come at me. Um, so. Um, Signage attributed to Raymond Lowy, but no one's sure about that. But we just thought if we took these letters, gave them to a really good type designer like Jonathan Heffler and Tobias Frere Jones, who were then partners, they could extrapolate a whole alphabet from it. So that required a kind of forensic reconstruction. It was almost like going to a crime scene, taking all the measurements of these things, figuring out what would happen if you filled in all the missing letters, right? So the whole digital alphabet ends up looking like that, and they call it Lever Sands. Um, ten, about tw tw almost 20 years later, they put it on the, I think Jonathan markets it now as a typeface called Landmark, I think, if you want to get some for yourself. For years, it only appeared in one place on this building. So these are the new signs looking just like the old signs. And so now we have all these code required signs with raised braille and stuff like that. But it still somehow looks very 1952, right? <clears throat> so this is another architectural collaboration. In this case, the architect is uh, Renzo Piano, and the um, assignment is um, the New York Times building. I'd worked with the Times for many years, but almost always doing these little black and white illustrations that would run on their editorial page, or, the, or in the book review, or on the letters page. And you do one of these things, it would take you a half day to do. You'd send it to them the day after they got it. They would run in the paper. You'd see people on the subway looking at your, ignoring basically your, your illustration. Um, you'd get really excited thinking, you know, I designed that. And they're like, you know, I never said that, of course. It's, cre it's creepy. Um, but, um, <laughs> but I thought that. Um, and then you get paid this little amount of money. It's very quick, satisfying work. Um, so stuff like this. 
against the expansion of NATO, um, questioning people's sincerity when they're anonymous, how to steal nuclear secrets or not, leftists who support military intervention. Um, this was the uh, Iraq war, the, the odometer rolling over. Um, I just knew that um, the uh, Supreme, they wanted something about the five to four balance of the Supreme Court, and I knew that building had nine columns in the front, and I was right, so you can do that, or eight columns, rather, so you can do that. Um, this was, uh, they had a story about uh, the end of The Sopranos, spoiler alert, it ends with the, kind of the screen goes to black, and that's supposed to be that. So, <clears throat> after auditioning with these tiny little drawings, um, they asked us to do all the signs for their new headquarters building designed by Renzo Piano. Um, Times Square, by the way, is named for the New York Times. That's where they started. It's the New York Times building there. Then they moved around the corner to this hulking, big, giant pile of stone, uh, windowless, dark, seedy, dusty. And they were there for years. Meanwhile, Times Square turned into the, the thing you picture in your mind when you hear Times Square, right? So weirdly, by code, Times Square, as far as I know, is the only place, and it's certainly the only place in the United States, it might be the only place in the world, that if you put up a new building, you are required to have big signs on that building. Believe me, um, around, you know, in Scottsdale and in tasteful neighborhoods around here, there are, it's the opposite. You can't put signs in the building because they're ugly. They want big signs, flashy signs, and the signs have to be stuck on the building. So then, that, then it'll keep Times Square, Times Square, right? What, that's Times Square. So the question is how you put a big sign on a building that's made of glass, basically with a little bit of steel, without blocking anyone's view. So what we did was we divided up that famous logo that's on the, the nameplate of the New York Times into 823, I think, separate little pieces, like that. And then we attached every one of those pieces to this um, series, um, there was, Piano had designed this whole, um, I guess, roster of horizontal rods made of ceramic, but really, really small, about that big, um, that go up and down the building that serve as a, uh, uh, a, a, it filters the light so it controls the heat coming in. Also in the winter retains the heat that could, um, you know, come out of the windows. So it's meant to sort of like be a, um, a climate control device, just made of these, like the shading device. So we attach those things to the, uh, to the um, uh, thing like that. If you line them up just so, those 823 pieces, it looks solid from the outside, particularly from underneath, because they each stick out like that. But on the inside, you can see the, um, the view, which is of the east facade of the Port Authority bus terminal. <laughs> did, did anyone see, did anyone see um, um, the deuce on HBO? With, um, that's, the, the Port Authority bus terminal looks exactly the same. It's the only part of New York that has not changed since 1972. So these people, who I think are the obituary writers, <laughs> are behind this fantastic sign looking at the bus terminal. But from underneath, day and night, you still see that sign. <clears throat> Failing New York Times. Um, so then they, um, <laughs> then they asked us to design all the signs inside the building. And I think they were kind of yearning for, this building was so clean, so beautiful, so transparent. There was this nostalgia premature nostalgia, preemptive nostalgia, about the, the place where they were before, up on 43rd Street, which is so dirty, dusty, horrible, cluttered, crowded, but it was home, right? And so I think one of the, one of the executives there said, it would be so great if you could, we could bring a little of that home into the new building. And so we came up with a scheme to make every one of those signs different as well. And I think there were like nearly a thousand of those, no two alike. And we and we made them different by using different images from the uh, photo archive of the times. So every bathroom has a different men's. Every men's room has different guys on it. Those guys, those guys, these ladies, or these ladies. A room, a room where they lay out the front page. Video edit room. There was, a, there was a great, anyone see that documentary, um, Obit, by any chance? It's really great a great documentary about those people in the obituary department. And there's a guy who works down in the archive of the New York Times 
and I can't tell whether it's the new building or the old building, because if it's the new building, he's managed to kind of like completely mess up the new building. It is so cluttered. And he can find any picture you want. So you would say, I think his name is Fred. You say, hey, Fred, equipment room, go. I need 12 of those. And he would have 120 if you asked. It was amazing. There were lots of team rooms, teams doing different things. Metaphoric, literal, dancing. Jazz hands, conference centers, conference rooms, pantries, copy room. Sometimes I'm not sure what, like, I think this might mean copy like text, not copy like, I don't know. Stat room, I don't know what that happens in this room either. There are these rooms that are privacy rooms. No one knows what happens in those rooms. The architects know what a riser closet is. I do not. Um, but I assume it involves something rising or, I don't know, <laughs> in the balcony. In the balcony. <laughs> um, so I put in this as an um, <clears throat> admission of, um, usually when people make presentations, or at least when I make presentations, I make them just a series of triumphs. Wow, I did it again. What, what do you think? You know? but in, but, this is an example of me kind of going off in a very wrong and bad direction. Um, led astray a little bit by an architect, but it was my own fault, not his. Um, we were asked to design a logo for the new home of the Museum of Arts and Design in New York City. Um, it was designed by Brad Klopfel of Allied Works in Portland. It's, a actual, it's actually a renovation of a, a fairly notorious uh, building on Columbus Circle by um, Edward Durrell Stone. Um, that it's this big, weird, marble, windowless thing that um, Ada Louise Huxtable called a, palatian, a, Venetian a, 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 a Venetian palace on lollipop sticks. She gave it a really funny name. It was nice. And then, um, but like, then it sat empty. It was owned by the city. Um, the museum bought it for a dollar on the condition that they would renovate it and, and occupy it and turn it into a working museum. They had Brad come in and figure out how to bring light and air into this kind of like airless, windowless shaft of a building. So th what he did was he made these cuts into it, like that. And those cuts actually are not just on the outside, but they snake through the floors and the ceilings as well, like that, right? <clears throat> so they said, um, do a logo. And I thought, I know exactly, for once, I don't have to think about it. I know exactly what to do. You're thinking what to do, too. Maybe you, maybe you agree with me. What the logo has to be is based on that idea of that single line snaking around. So it looks like this. It says A plus D, right? So I thought this was great. It's like I'm thinking, you know, so good. How do I do it? It's amazing. So, um, <laughs> so I take it and I show it to them, and they have some questions, you know. <laughs> you know, first... The folks in the museum would have to cha literally change the fucking name of the museum to accommodate my logo. Um, people, it's called Museum of Arts and Design, but everyone called it MAD, M-A-D. Why not? It's a pronounceable one-syllable, three-letter name, right? Um, but I thought, it, well, it's, not, it's, a it's the name of a magazine with Alfred E. Newman. It means <laughs> anger. I said, you don't want that name. You want this new name, A plus D. That's what you're all about, the combining arts and design. Okay. So they said it was sort of hard to read. Now. Okay, let's go back and look. <laughs> so that's an A, right? That's a plus sign, and that's a D. And they said, well, how, why is that a D and not like an O? And I said, well, it's a D because it has like this part here, right? <laughs> and, <clears throat> and they said, well, why, if it has that part there, you know what D looks like, it looks like that. If that's supposed to be like that, why, isn't there, why is that happening there? And it turns out <clears throat> these things with the continuous lines, because of, arithmetic or something, they have to work a certain way and they can't cross themselves a weird number of times. So if you do, if you make this, that happen here, it doesn't work. <clears throat> it's two lines. I'm going to lose my voice just whinging about this. I apologize. Even now it pains me. Okay, so three problems. <laughs> and, then, and then actually that problem that clients sometimes have, they just really didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. But, but these were polite, respectful clients, and they never just said, please stop. And I kept coming back, and I kept thinking, 
I'm just not, it's like a joke that doesn't work right. I think I'm not telling it right. You know, so I keep saying, okay, I got you this time. So I would come back and I'd say, we have to, you know, they have to see what it's really going to be like. So let's make some mock-ups of stationery. Let's show we can be all these different colors. Mock-ups of stationery and press kits. Come back again. Okay, I got it. Shopping bags. <laughs> <clears throat> and you know what's funny is they never said, stop, we hate this. They just were like, you know, hmm. They, like, and finally, I, I went back and I said, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm boring myself at this point. And I think, I feel like we're just pounding away at this square peg and it's supposed to go in a round hole. And then I thought, hey, square peg, round hole, let's try something different. So it just so happens that this is a square building and it sits on Manhattan's only full traffic circle. Um, documentary proof of that. Um, so why not just like make it about squares and circles, right? A square, a circle, you do that, you do that, you do that, it's done. It was that easy. <laughs> and, and it's just, you just have to stop being so clever and just relax into the solution. It's there, right? And so what's so funny is that all those other things, we'd have, we had that great idea that I had, the not so great idea. <clears throat> and it just took so much to kind of like, you know, kind of just work it. This thing just did itself. It's like someone said, I think I just idly said to my, the designer on the job, Joe Marianic, I said, Joe, I bet we can make a whole typeface, right? And he said, yeah, I guess so. And then he came back and he had that, like in hours, right? And then once you have that, you can write anything you want with it. The logo turns into a whole kind of brand language. Put it on buses, put it on banners. You can even write long passages just for the hell of it. No one can read that, of course. But you can't actually read it, you can read it, but. So um, uh, in the environment, shopping bags. <laughs> so sometimes, sometimes when you're, you're trying to get in the front door and like you just, it's locked, right? And you think you're a master lock picker. I know how to do this, I'm a cat burglar. Sort of like, you know, you're loosening the hinges, you're trying all these different like picks in the lock. Then finally you sort of think, I'm just gonna bust it down and get like a battering ram and it's still not working. Then you just you walk around to the back of the house just to pee or something, and then there's a door there, and you try the knob, and it's open. Oh, just walk right in, right? <laughs> try it. That's, that's a metaphor, but it actually really, really works. Go around to the back and come in that way. If you want to, if you want to go nuts and wear a tie, there you have it. If you can read this, you are mad. That's the language. Okay. <clears throat> So this is a um, uh, moment just for the hardcore graphic design types here. We got an assignment to do a wayfinding system for the whole city of New York. Um, there's going to be a new program for pedestri helping pedestrians get around, walkers get around, called Walk NYC, what it looks like. It's the logo for it. So it, it had five pilot zones, a lot of research, a lot of process things going on, big team working on it with wayfinding consultants, with map consultants, with uh, um, community um, interface people, product designers, engineers, all trying to figure out how you do wayfinding in a city where it's not like an airport where everyone comes to the front door and they all want to get on a plane. In New York, anyone can be anywhere and they can want to go any other where. And some people are tourists, and this is the first day they're there, and this might be the last day they're there. Some people are, live there all their life. Some people live there all their life, but they've never been in this neighborhood. Some people are in a hurry. Some people are, have to get to the meeting or else they'll be fired. Some people are just wandering around. And like, so how do you do signage for that? Well, you have to figure out where all the signs go, how you actually pick out the landmarks that people navigate by. It just takes a lot of research. So a lot of working out of this sort of theory um, it was going to be in Chinatown, 34th Street, Long Island City, um, Brooklyn, and then they were introducing bike rentals, and so they're going to have these maps be for all the bike rentals too. So a lot of walking around, talking to people, trying to figure out how they navigate. We did this exercise where we get, asked people to draw the city in their minds. So if there are any people who really know New York or ex-New Yorkers or people who lived in New York, you'll appreciate this. Someone thinks this is their map of New York. <laughs> Here's Manhattan. Here's the Williamburg Bridge going towards the east. Here's Brooklyn, which is a long, skinny island, which is between Manhattan and New Jersey. 
And the George Washington Bridge also connects to New Jersey. And I guess beyond that, if you go all the way around the world, it connects back up to New Jersey. It's just miraculous. <laughs> So, like, if you're really making maps for New Yorkers, you sort of have a real challenge because, you know, you know they tell you what you can do with your map. They don't need it. So a lot of studies like this. Um, uh, you know, we, we acknowledge that our part of it was in the middle of a whole sequence of, of information disclosure moments. And so, we did, you know, we were only being asked to do some things there, but, like, buses, subways, taxis, all these other things have information, too. Um, we sort of came up with a basic party of the whole thing where we sort of like said what information had to be communicated and where and how. And then we had to sort of determine a graphic language for New York. And I, we did try to invent something new, but sometimes inventing something new is folly and you have to actually look at what's already there and what works. And um, so there are lots of different kind of languages that exist on the streets of New York, but the one that I thought was the most compelling was what my old boss, my mentor Massimo Vignelli did back in 1969 the sign system for the New York subway system, which is still in use today. And this is the famous manual he did back with Bob Norda at the end of the 60s. And, you know, that was a picture we took, uh, you know, months ago, basically. So it's um, uh, black, primary colors, Helvetica, right? So we just thought we'd take that classic typeface with a few alterations and then combine it with a color palette that's essentially neutral with one bright taxi cab yellow kind of uh, accent. And then we worked out an icon system, again, studying all these different pre-existing icons, but then kind of, kind of coming down on a series that, again, are familiar, but we have customized. Okay, graphic designers, here it comes. So if, anyone, if you're ever in New York, you want to wow, wow your friends or maybe alienate your friends completely, you could point out to them, hey, did you know these bathroom icons have been redrawn so that it perfectly matches the uh, curve on um, you know, Helvetica, that that skirt thing is just like that, that these look. It's not just that either, folks. It goes on and on, right? And so this seems insane, and it is insane, unless you're a graphic designer. And, and, and the reason is, is all this stuff has to coexist in really a small bit of real estate. These icons pile up next to words, words pile up to other words, those things pile up next to other things. And if you, you have to do everything you can to have them look like they all are coming from the same place, hence this madness, right? So and then we custom, we, you know, we, for, there's an there's a official, uh, a uh, U.S. Department of Transportation uh, symbol for shopping, which is a bag, but we put Milton Glaser's logo on it. We redrew the bikes so it looked a little bit more like the city bike bike share. And then we had to figure out how to draw the landmarks of New York, the buildings that you sort of see. Picked out a whole bunch that we thought people were likely to navigate by. <clears throat> you had to decide, could you do them just with outlines? How much detail was too much detail? And we sort of had this idea of just simply superimposing them in a ghosted sort of way on top of the city grid. Because oddly, unlike other cities, so many New York landmarks are kind of just viewed in elevation as opposed to, um, you know, in the round. If you go to London, they have a mapping system. They have these beautiful axonometric drawings of the, uh, of the buildings. If you did that with New York, it sort of would be, a, be sort of a waste of time because the Empire State Building sort of looks the same from, it, it looks like that, right? So that was a process by which no computers, no, oh, well, computers were involved, but basically what was really involved was a lot of interns who we pay well and <laughs> to just take things like that and do that so that eventually they can take their place with other things like that, right? So there's a whole bunch of these things too, it works of art in and of themselves. And um, the physical form of the science is based on kind of a very pared down modernist language like that, so basically, you know, just like uh, you know, post-war skyscrapers, all modular, snapped together, put together off-site, delivered in the dead of night, and then you wake up and there they are. So no, uh, uh, some of them have a little bit of electricity that kind of have. This is one that kind of has express bus information, but most of them are perfectly analog. Um, uh, Manhattan could lose all its power and these things would still work as good as they work now. Fun, you know, the theory is that everyone has a, uh, 
um, a, you know, a, a GPS system on their phone, and why would they need this? And it's remarkable to see how many people cluster around these things, kind of debating where they're going to go next, arguing about whether they want to go here or here. You can't do that with a phone. You can do that with a map like this. It's Um, I just have a couple more, thank God, and my voice is actually doing a lot better than I thought. So, um, so the newest, biggest, and best public park in New York was designed by a landscape firm called uh, West 8, led by a brilliant Dutch landscape architect named Adrian Guse. And um, it is uh, Governor's Island, which is about 600 yards off the coast of lower Manhattan. That's... Um, Manhattan there, and then you get on a ferry, and literally minutes later, you are in this amazing wonderland that is not connected to any other landmass by any bridges or anything else. It's only reachable by ferry or boat. And it used to be a military base. And they decided, uh, uh, it got decommissioned, the government sold it to the city of New York, and uh, the city is turning it into a park. And the park is now well along in its parkhood, and we were asked to do the signs for it. So um, basically, yeah, yeah, there's fun facts about this. The original island was here. This part is all landfill from digging some of the subways. And so uh, that was where most of the real kind of hardcore military stuff was. These were all a bunch of really beautiful old 19th century buildings there. And so we were asked to do these custom signs for the park. There's a whole story about how I messed this up too. And I was designing these stupid signs that were really horrible that no one liked. And I, I stuck with it for about a month. Then finally I showed it to one of my partners, Paula Cher, who had never been to this island. And she said, again, show me what, what's the idea of this island. And I said, well, I showed her this picture. And she said, "All this, just make the signs look like that. Because you can see through them. This place is about views. Why are you putting up these big bulky signs? I'm not showing you pictures of the bulky signs this time. You know, we'll make you suffer through that. So basically, um, we did these see-through signs that are made of metal. They also can look like trellises a little bit. And my dream is that the landscapers on the island will permit all these signs to just be engulfed by vines. But they're too precise, and they don't seem to be interested in letting that happen as much as I want it to happen. But we um, also had to make a brand new typeface by kind of taking a industrial typeface and kind of curving it out a little bit before and after. <clears throat> it's just so you know, because it's on the water and it's like an island all the way around. So you get this nice play of kind of the mechanical world of the industrial with the sensuous world of nature and water. And it's really fantastic. If you're in New York and it's open, it's only open during the warm weather months. But if you get a chance to go there, it's just fantastic. So you arrive now, and uh, that's that gantry. Um, that's that typeface writ large. Um, you pass through this kind of ornamental gate that has these great signs. You look over your shoulder, and it's all backwards, which I, I, I mean, I really like signs forwards, but I really also like them backwards. Um, it tastes light really beautifully. You can see through them. And then when you're out in the wild, they seem to be kind of growing up as mysteriously as some of the trees are, right? And then even just sort of the everyday signs. We tried to make this really feel like a place apart a little bit. And it really is amazing. You turn your head and you're like looking at, you know, the, the most, you know, overbuilt city in the world and you're like on this, you know, the desert island. And, and the only place in New York where you can see the front of the Statue of Liberty. You sign designers know this is the only sign that really matters, right? And all the other ones are just like for show. This is the one people care about. It looks good tonight. Dramatic like that. Okay. Um, this is not this for graphic designers, for architects now. <clears throat> we were brought by the, uh, asked by the, uh, I got an, an RFP from the AIA to do a new logo for them. And I think some architects may not agree, but I sense that the AIA had problems that might be bigger than a logo. We did a lot of studies trying to get to the bottom of what those problems might be. 
Um, a lot of them were outside my scope. They had to do with you know, organizational dysfunction and other things. So, um, But I do know how to design logos and typography, so we kind of did all that work. Then we kind of came at it from the other end a little bit. So, and, and really, they have a lot of challenges, but fundamental to all of them is how do you make this institution that's been around for a long time feel relevant to the next generation of architects and the generation beyond that? They've been around since the mid-19th century. Their image has evolved. It still feels dated way back, way back when, way back when, and this is how they looked when they came to us. So this isn't really the most important thing in the world, but it was a symbolic gesture. We thought, what if you wrote your name in a bolder way than just kind of some squished bedoni? And so we thought, now, forgive me, I'm kind of like getting dangerously close to talking about architecture, but like post and lintel construction, which I looked up on Wikipedia this afternoon to make sure I wasn't going to embarrass myself. Strong verticals holding up these crossing members that are a little bit narrower. So you take AIA, you, that thing is like um, a nice column, right? So we kind of put like the column top and bottom on that. And then because of architecture, you take those these thick guys here, you make them skinny like that, and then you sort of have a typeface that starts to look a little architectural. The details. <laughs> Sexy. <laughs> So that's a little peculiar looking, but we wanted something that was a little bit idiosyncratic so that you would come to associate it with AIA, the thin weight of it. So a little bit of testing things out. Can ye quote on the bottom, can ye quote on the bottom there? Cabousier lamps. And so uh, it got debuted for the um, three years ago when they did their national conference in Chicago. Great place to debut uh, something for architects because you have a lot to work with. You can channel uh, Daniel Burnham if you want, make, make no small plans. They don't have the power to stir men's souls. You can sort of save in stirring souls since 1857. Um, AIA, you can kind of uh, force feed into the word Chicago, and it gives you a nice chic and go top and bottom. And then just kind of like doing just straightforward stuff, it kind of looks cool. One of those typefaces. I think roughly chronological order, I believe. Burnham, Sullivan, Wright, Mies van der Rohe. Jamie Gang, looking to the future. And so then um, they, they do a lot of public awareness campaigns. This is the first one, they've done several since, but sort of just talking about AIA's role in society and how it serves the common good was places of learning, ameliorating um, uh, people's loss of their homes. And then finally, as part of this process, I wrote a, um, this like, kind of manifesto that was what I thought, the, what I thought architects wanted. So this is the most dangerous part. Um, it's the only part that has music. So I can just let you read it and kind of like eat another lozenge while you do, okay? So here it goes. We don't have the music. It doesn't matter. Don't worry, Michael. You get the idea. Oh, voila. Hang on, I'm going to go to the top, OK? okay. It's, got nice, it's got cute music to it. I think.
Get it? It's like. No, this is the last one. <coughs> Testing. Okay. So, um, my first job at Vignelli, the first project I worked on virtually was for the Architectural League of New York. They've been there since way before I got there. But um, Massimo was on their board, and um, um, he was volunteering a lot of free work. And he asked, and so I was the newest guy and the cheapest guy probably to do the free work, so uh, do this work. And um, today, 40, almost 40 years later, I am on their board now, and I'm doing the same thing, right? So this is... 35 years ago. Um, they have a long running program called Emerging Voices, 83. Um, Anthony Ames, Kruik and Olson, Twani and Plotter Zyberg. So Eric, this Eric, Eric Owen Moss is on this one, it was in uh, 84. Henry Smith Miller. So they, they, like, they, this is for mid career architects. And so they, does anyone know that band Chicago? Does anyone know what their covers look like? It's the same gimmick. You sort of like have one thing and just do it all these different ways. So I did this for about 10 years straight for them. It's really nice. There it is again. I did a series of one-off posters that were for different lectures. This was a lecture that um, 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 the British, the British postmodernist, James, James, James Sterling, right? Jim Sterling, lecture by him. Um, Arthur Drexler gave a lecture called The Unfinished Modern. These guys kept coming up with lecture titles that were based on perfect square numbers, so you could do that with them. God bless them. Um, the competition about building metaphoric bridges. Um, were you involved with that one? Bridges? No. Uh, competition uh, uh, where the theme was hypotheses. A competition where the theme was scale. It's about actual size, actually. You can't do that anymore because of the environment, but those were the days. Uh, we, uh, we designed books for them, encapsulating all those years of emerging voices, for instance. Um, they moved from their home on Upper Madison Avenue to Soho. This announced that move. Um, they've had a series of, um, um, they throw a big party every fall called the Beaux-Arts Ball, and so every time that is a, uh, a theme that the architects concoct, and we do a poster and invitation for it. This theme was dot, 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 this theme was light years. There, um, this was used as a prop in a movie, and the actress Rooney, it's in a bathroom. The actress Rooney Mara enters the bathroom. You, you see my poster. She stands in front of the poster, then she bends over and throws up in the bathroom. <laughs> <clears throat> and while she's puking, you're looking at my poster. And then, then the same thing happens again in a flashback later in the movie. It's really, it's my favorite movie. <laughs> uh, they, uh, they did a party where the theme was ism. So that's a tote bag. The party with the theme was craft. I can prove it to you. C R A F T. It's all there. Um, a party where the theme was threshold. In the end, so we don't do posters anymore. We do GIFs or GIFs. And then they turn into programs and stuff. Projections. The theme was Tapiola Raza this year. In, uh, two years ago in 2016. And then the, they had a theme of alchemy last year. Ooh. So if you like that effect, you can get in the take home edition. It's a little flip book. <laughs> and projections again, tote bags. I, I, it is exciting when any of us on my team see people with these tote bags, like on airplanes or subways or something, get really agitated. They go, oh. but then again, creepy, creepy. Just, just don't take a picture. Just. <laughs> um, this is a, um, uh, the Young Architects competition. The theme is objective. Wait for it. So um, they give something called the President's Medal, and my mentor Massimo Vignelli got it a few years ago, so I, I was honored to design all the stuff for that celebration. 
and it's just a lot of quotes that I actually learned at his hand that I've tried to take uh, as my own. If you do the right, it'll, it'll last forever. Fight against the ugliness. Design one thing, you can design anything. These are all things that I'm not sure I can live up to as he did, but I think as a designer, you have to have mentors. You have to be a mentor. You have to be a prodigy. You have to look for prodigies, and, uh, or protégés, rather. And I think um, uh, the idea that as designers, we're participating in a larger community that when you've done it long enough, you realize it goes back and it goes beyond. And that's really the exciting thing. So he got the, uh, he got the medal, that's him with the press sheet. And then we were lucky enough to actually get to design the medal. So thank you. Thank you. See how far I can go if I can. Say, 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 who's the sadist who wants me to answer a question? Come on. Okay, go ahead. You are unabashed about using typography in your logo types in the collateral and the headlines and supporting types. I'm sorry, 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 I miss, tell, tell us about that. I'm sorry, say, can you say the beginning part of that when I was coughing? Right. You must. You're, are you a graphic designer? That's an esoteric question, if you ask me. I'm a graphic designer. Okay, there you go. So. She also runs Ah, well, okay. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, I'll give it a try, Allison. Um, if you, um, wait a second. Um, if you, if. What, what, what Allison is talking about is, say if you take, like Coca-Cola has a way they write Coca-Cola, right? But they don't write everything like that. They only write one thing like that. They write Coca-Cola in that script, right? So sometimes there's a model where that's the only time you do it. Like the Chanel logo, you just, Chanel's written that way, and then, you know, they're advertising everything else. They use a different typeface. So I think sometimes it sort of depends if you've got a typeface, which is really idiosyncratic, but still legible enough, like the mad, like the mad one. I thought that actually worked. Then there, then sometimes, like we did, uh, we redid the Verizon logo. Just try to make a nice, boring Helvetica, and all their other stuff was in boring Helvetica because they're, you know, they're they're a telephone company, and you know, it's not, you know, you just want to, you just want to, like, you just want to, to get the signal and have no drama, right? So I think sometimes you're doing it to sort of. You do it because you're small and you want to have a bigger footprint sometimes. Sometimes you're doing it because you're big and you want to just signal consistency. But I don't think there's a rule about it. I've, I've done it that way and I've done it not that way many times. Is that satisfying? Yeah, I, I think it works best in the <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, yeah it's, it certainly isn't a rule that I would insist, that I would sort of say is the right way to do it. There's, I, I think it's, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And in fact, sometimes when we're presenting work to clients, we'll have three different directions. I'm like my old boss, Massimo, just in one. I would have, you have three different directions, and one of them might actually have that as the strategy, but the other two might not. It just really depends. You sort of like work it out, and you're trying to see. So sometimes it just feels too, too um, um, monotone in a way. Sometimes you, sometimes it feels like unison. You know, so always, there's a fine line between those two things. I'll go one more. Anyone's got one? Maybe I'll ask. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, as architects or future architect, in hopefully in my place, um, what advice do you have for us about graphic design? Um, should we? Should we <laughs> well, I want to ask the same. Other than hiring you, because we can't afford it. <laughs> um. Uh, I. I I used to um, I used to go up to Yale to kind of crit the students in their portfolios, and um, I have to admit that I think 
all designers are better graphic designers now than they used to be, including architects, including product designers, including fashion designers. I think that it used to be graphic designers used to sort of like keep the tools that we had, the names of typefaces, the places where you could get typefaces. Those were all like this black art that no one was supposed to know about. <laughs> and, and I think with digital media, everyone has access to those tools. And I think I've seen really good work done by, um, done by really good graphic design work done by architects. I mean, Snow Hedda does beautiful graphic design work. And there's other, um, there's other firms that do good design work. So I think, I mean, the, I mean, the rules are sort of not that different than what you'd hear in a place like this. The cliches, you know, form, form follows function, less is more. Most of those things are true about typefaces, layouts, logos, all those things, right? Um, they're also true um, if you care about musical theater. Stephen Sondheim wrote a whole book about how he writes musicals, and he has almost the virtually same principles. Less is more, form follows function. Um, and so you really realize that these things are they're cliches, but they also have this oddly and eerily universal application, which is, you know, if you just sort of like trust your own taste and kind of just try to like follow some basic principles you already know from architecture, you, you could get pretty close, I think. That's it. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to tell a little anecdote, which is just a way to get Michael to the board so we can go to the, <laughs> which is what you probably don't know is that when you were designing the MAD logo, uh, your client, Holly Hoxner, who was the most brilliant, uh, passive aggressive <coughs> museum director ever known to man. She turned it into one of the best museums of New York, and she was absolutely madly to work with. Uh, and she actually, the second design, uh, she actually sent it to me and said to me, can you read this? <laughs> so, <laughs> so somehow I would say no. And I said, yes, I can do that. I said, yes, really beautiful. Let's have one more uh, round of applause for <laughs> And join us for uh, a drink.